On Saturday, August 17, 1974, Ruth Dorsey of Beauregard, Alabama, filled up her tank at Spring Villa Grocery and got into her 1972 Ford Galaxy and drove away. She has never been seen or heard from since. The local church folks started to worry when she didn't show up to play piano at the Hopewell Revival on Sunday morning and how her car was found later parked near the Confederate Memorial in downtown Opelika with the keys still in the ignition, her glasses, and her purse sitting on the seat with $11 in cash still inside. Her house was eerily untouched and laundry on the line. Her Bible and Sunday school materials were laid out for the next day. Her dogs were found cowering in the bathroom, terrified. Despite extensive searches involving helicopters and the FBI came in to investigate, and even a couple of psychics came in, there was never a trace of Mrs. Dorsey. To this day, it remains one of Lee County's most haunting and enduring mysteries a question mark that still hangs in the air over the tiny town of Beauregard. Um, Ruth Dorsey went missing August the 17th, 1974. She is classified endangered missing. She was a white female. She was 69 years old at the time of her disappearance. 5'4 and 105 pounds. She was last known to be wearing a flowered blouse and long brown skirt or possibly pants. She was driving a 1972 Ford Galaxy which was found along with some of her belongings. She had light brown hair and gray eyes. She was last seen at the Spring Villa grocery store around 4.30 to 5 o'clock p.m. She bought gasoline for her car and told the gas station attendant that a relative had called her and she was going to pick this person up. Doesn't say where or um, who the person was that had called. One of her neighbors reported seeing her turn into her driveway around 6 p.m., but she has not been seen since. She was reported missing after she failed to arrive at church the next day. She was a Sunday school teacher and played the piano at the church, and it was very uncharacteristic of her to miss church. Authorities went to her home in Opelika, and they found the front door open and a side door unlocked. Laundry was hanging on the outside clothesline, and her Bible and Sunday school materials were laid out on the table in preparation for church the next day. Her bed had not been slept in, and her three dogs were found cowering in the bathroom, which was unusual. Um, The animals would typically bark and defend the property if someone came to the door, and this is probably why this whoever it was locked them in the bathroom. Her car was found in downtown Opelika, near the First Baptist Church, after her disappearance. The keys were in the ignition, and her glasses and purse were on the front seat. Nothing appeared to be missing. The purse contained $11 in cash. Investigators stated it appeared that the car had been left by someone who was running an errand and intended to return a short time. Well, I don't know about that. Um, A woman alone and even in a small town, even a town that she knew, would not leave her keys and her purse in her car. If she planned to leave her purse in her car, she would lock the doors and take the keys. So I think that her car had been driven there after someone had probably come to her house. Whoever this relative was that she had come to pick up was this person questioned. Because someone locked the dogs in the bathroom, so... Um, The vehicle was parked in front of the first house Dorsey had lived in with her late husband. The door of the house was open, but authorities found no indications that she had been there. There have been no withdrawals from her bank account since she disappeared. Police initially believed that she left on her own, but her family suspected foul play from the beginning. They said it was very uncharacteristic of her to leave without letting anyone know where she was going. She taught French and mathematics 
and she got married in 1928. Her husband died in 1965. After his death, she worked at the First National Bank in o Opelika. She retired shortly before her disappearance. She was described as a strong, independent woman. Her case remains unsolved. We'll move a little farther north now to South Carolina. South Carolina has numerous unsolved mysteries involving missing persons and murders that continue to baffle investigators. Every state has its unsolved mysteries, and South Carolina is no different. No one wants to think there is evil that walks among us, and evil that stalks the dark in the night. But we must not forget the ones that have left us mysteriously. Someone out there knows something about each and every one of these mysteries. It's up to us to not let them grow cold. Now the first one that I'm going to talk about is Malikia, Malikia Logan of Greenwood, South Carolina. This happened on May 15, 1988, somewhere between the small park that was just 300 yards away from the apartment door where she lived. She never came home with her sister. They had been playing basketball together in the park when she decided to go home. Malikia decided to go home. But her bike was found near the apartment office. There were witnesses that say a white male with a pock-marked face driving an older model Monte Carlo, but none of them ever saw him, or no one ever saw her with him, but they saw him in the, in the parking lot area. Throughout the 30-year investigation, various leads and suspects would come and go. However, the abduction and murder of Kia Logan has gone unsolved. On May 15, 1988, all seemed to be well in the world. It was a Sunday in Greenwood, South Carolina, a small town roughly an hour north of Augusta, Georgia. As the sun was beginning to set at around 8.30 p.m., 8-year-old Malikia Logan, also who went by the nickname Kia, decided to go home. She climbed onto her bike and headed home, which was about a 300 yards or so from the um, basketball court where she was playing with her sister. Her sister decided to stay out a little bit longer. Her sister returned to the apartment about a half an hour later and found that Kia had not returned. She knew that there were no other children left outside as she was one of the last ones to come in. So they went around, they started going door to door looking for her. They started walking around the apartment complex trying to find her. And this is when they found her bike near the office of the apartment complex. So Malikia, who went by the nickname Kia, was born in August of 1979. Her father, Richard Logan, was the mayor of a small South Carolina town named Saluda. However, she lived with her mother, Bern Bernetta Baylor, who was a teacher at a nearby middle school. She had one sister named Renee, and the three of them lived in the apartment complex. Around 9 o'clock that evening, her mother reported her missing. The Greenwood County Sheriff's Department responded, and Dennis Beauford was one of the first deputies to arrive at the scene. He said, I had a gut feeling that something just wasn't right, and I called Riley at home. Now, this was Major Sam Riley, who was the um, with the Greenwood County Sheriff's Office. Now, he came out and took the report, and he says, we treated it strictly as a missing person, just as we would with anyone else. A missing persons report was filed, and Kia was listed as being 4 foot 2 inches tall and weighing at around 70 pounds. She was a small girl and had been wearing yellow shorts and a yellow and white polka dot shirt. Dennis Beaufort, the responding deputy, ended up spending the night at the apartment with the family on the couch waiting for phone calls, waiting for Kia to come through the door. 
Unfortunately, nothing happened, and the next day they began the investigation into her disappearance. Monday, May the 16th, 75 people helped conduct a search around the apartment complex. They combed around the apartments for most of the night, until the lack of light eventually led them to stop. They had been aided earlier in the day by helicopters from the South Carolina law enforcement, and there were nothing, no clues came up. On May 30th, over two weeks after Kia had disappeared, investigators were still optimistic, but it was short-lived as the weeks bled into months. On July the 4th, the Greenwood Area newspaper, the Index Journal, ran a story detailing Kia's mom, Bernetta Logan, as she struggled with the disappearance of her daughter. In the weeks since Kia had gone missing, Bernetta struggled to leave the phone. She would stay in her apartment on the couch all day and night waiting for a phone call. Despite this overwhelming sadness experienced by Bernetta and her family, the article had a, an effect on the community. The next day, a retired pediatrician named Casper Wiggins wrote a heartfelt editorial. A child is missing, he wrote, and apart from the few days immediately after her kidnapping, the public outcry has been next to nothing. If this was a Clemson or Carolina sports event, it would take the forefront and the emotions would bubble over. Can't we show at least as much concern for the fate of a child? It's a pity if we don't. Does it bother anyone as it bothers me that our community, with a few exceptions, seems to be showing little concern over the mysterious disappearance of one of our children? It bothers me that we seem willing to accept this as a crime against a child without a public uproar. I think the authorities are working hard to solve the case, and I'm not criticizing those who have come forward to help. Despite this, police would not have any answers until October of 1990. On October the 1st, 1990, a Monday, a hunter was in the area just outside of Newbury, South Carolina. The wooded area just off of Mount Pleasant Road is about four miles northeast of Newbury and about 35 miles away from where Kia disappeared. The hunter walked along a pasture fence and he stumbled upon a small object. As he looked closer, he realized it resembled a human skull. He called police, and they came out to the scene. Little could be determined about how the victim died, or the skull showed no signs of obvious trauma, bullet holes, or anything like that. They determined that the victim had been 13 years of age or younger. This meant that police were pretty confident that, they, that the skull had been intentionally left because there was no digging as though it had been buried or anything like that. The skull was sent to the University of South Carolina where a forensic anthropologist was able to tell that the skull belonged to an African American around eight years of age. The skull was then sent to the National Museum of Natural History in Washington DC for DNA testing. In 1996, the testing of mitochondrial DNA was performed in a lab in North Carolina. The results were testing alongside DNA taken from both Kia's parents. At this time, it proved that this was the skull of Kia Logan. The FBI forensic investigators theorized that Kia had been killed in Greenwood um, and then dumped in Newbury County. It took over a decade, but Kia's parents were finally given the answer as to what had happened to their daughter. Well, I don't think that they had gotten an answer as to what happened to her exactly, but they knew now where she, you know, part of her body was. Um, they believe that she died um, very soon after she was abducted. 
Okay, so when the skull was discovered in 1990, it proved a long clue in a vast sea of nothingness. However, by the time the skull forensics were proven to be Kia, they had a suspect they believe was not only responsible for her death, but for an assortment of various sex assaults and crimes against children. His name was Charles Wade Hampton. Between the years 1995 and 1996, the states of Georgia and South Carolina began investigating a series of sexual assaults that occurred interstate, meaning in between both states. In all of the assaults, the victim's profile remained largely the same. There were six victims in total, all of whom were young black girls between the ages of five and nine. The lone exception was a five-year-old girl whose skin tone was a little dark, but she wasn't black. They all lived in housing close to the highway in question, and they were all abducted from one location. In most cases, they were sexually assaulted before being abandoned in a public setting. But at least one of the girls wasn't. She was simply abducted and then dumped off at a gas station where she was able to call for help. It was described as a middle-aged white man with some type of gray stubble on his face and a pocked mark complexion. He had a tattoo on his bicep that some of the girls described as being a dragon, while others described as a snake. Charles Wade Hampton was born September the 21st, 1952. He was about 5 foot 8 inches tall and was a very slight build, only weighing at around 130 pounds. He had green eyes and brown hair and a brown mustache, and usually a couple of days worth of gray stubble. He also had a blotchy, pockmarked face. Early on in the investigation, Charles admitted that he often changed his hair color. His ex-wife agreed to that, saying that she often helped him dye his hair. He was a former Department of Transportation employee who lived outside of Clark County, Georgia, and he worked as a maintenance man at a local park. Well, maybe he came into contact with some of these children at this park. It was a state park. He had been terminated due to an unexcused absence and tardiness. So he was arrested in 1996 after he was caught drilling holes into the wall of the women's bathroom. He was drilling these holes as peep holes so he could look in on the women and girls. At the time of his arrest, he was 44 years old and driving a white 1986 Dodge 600. Police noted that he had a snake tattoo on his upper arm. He also had scars along his right arm and stomach, which matched up with what one of the young victims had described. Upon his arrest, he was very cooperative with law enforcement. He voluntarily consented to, to allow police to search his vehicle and waived his rights to a search warrant. He also voluntarily provided blood and hair samples. While police began to, a search of his home and vehicle, he, he openly began to talk about his sex life, which he described, which included bondage, and that he enjoyed having sex with both genders. In 1981, he had been arrested and convicted for the rape of a 16-year-old Police found many items inside his car, such as clothing, toilet paper, a marriage certificate, nude photos of women, and um, pornographic magazines. Most concerning were torn out images of children. When they searched his home, they found several photographs of children in their underwear. Police also found pairs of children's underwear in his laundry, 
that were sent off for forensic testing. After this discovery, interrogator circled back to Hampton, and he was even more willing to talk. He talked about his conviction for sexual assault in 1981. They questioned him about the recent sexual assaults of these children. He said a suspect would know how not to get caught. Charles Hampton agreed to give up blood and hair samples. When they continued their rounds of questioning, he was eager to talk. He openly confessed to committing several of the child abductions and described details of the sexual assaults of these children. Many of these details matched up with what police had heard from the victims. Hampton confessed to committing three child abductions and even confessed to killing a child out on a farm. Police were able to link Hampton to a farm owned in northern Georgia, which was owned by one of his family friends. He was known to spend a good amount of time at this farm. Police took Hampton out of jail and drove him to many of the landmarks where the abductions had taken place. He knew information immediately. He was able to give them details. And police also said it seemed almost like he was making things up as he went along. As some of the facts that he gave were not lining up. Police then spoke to Hampton's ex-wife and current girlfriend, who told them things about Charles that made them think he was a suspect. They said that he was constantly changing his hair color and changing cars. Police tried to pinpoint the motive for his confessions. The forensic analysis they were hoping for came back. The DNA testing from the six sexual assaults linked them together, indicating that a single suspect was behind each of the crimes. However, none of the samples matched up to Charles Hampton. If they wanted to try him for any of those crimes, they needed a smoking gun. It all pointed to a very confusing puzzle. See, so all of the DNA or all of the blood or all of the samples that they got back from all of these crimes were all linked to one person, but none of it matched this man, this Hampton. Um, he pled guilty to the peeping Tom charge and drilling the holes in the wall, and he spent five years in state prison. As soon as Charles went to jail for the peeping Tom charge, he stopped cooperating with investigators. He recanted all of his confessions, and this meant that the police had to start over. Upon his arrest in 1996, the string of child abductions plaguing the area seemed to come to an end. Police and prosecutors seemed certain at the time of this indictment, November of 2002, that Charles Hampton was responsible for the abduction and murder of Kia Logan. They were prepared to pursue the death penalty in an upcoming criminal trial. The prosecutors consulted Kia's family throughout the process. The family, to their credit, was steadfast in their conviction and wanted to see Hampton in court to face the charges against him. However, the criminal trial would never come to be. On June the 22nd, 2007, the charges against Charles Wade Hampton were suddenly dropped. It had been nearly five years since the original indictment was filed, accusing him of the abduction and murder of Kia Logan. Prosecutors, confident that their case against him was rock solid, were now worried that they did not have enough evidence to convict him. They wanted to keep their options open, and they wanted to gather more evidence. They didn't want to give him a chance to walk free. Oh, they didn't think that they had enough. They thought his confession was false. They didn't have any DNA or anything to uh, tell how she died. All they had was her skull. And so they just didn't think that they had enough to bring a case against him that would stand up. He was convicted of a felony for lying to police and lying about these crimes, leading them to take time away from investigating who may really have been behind these crimes. 
Now, the person writing this article said that they could not find any record of him. There's only a brief mention of him. And this was in 2007. I will check on him before I finish this video just to see if I can find anything more about him. Police still believe that he was the responsible person responsible for Kia Logan's abduction and murder. And um, it has been over a decade since there was any news or developments in the investigation. In 2009, the Kia Logan Memorial Scholarship was established at Lander University. Uh, this is in Greenwood, the reward fund started with $2,000 and had grown to $20,328. So they decided to put the money to good use and used it to allow for a scholarship in nursing majors or education majors in that college. Police have long held the theory that the abduction and murder of Kia Logan was a crime of opportunity they believe this was just a random child abduction and that this person just happened to see her alone and grabbed her and took her. Now they compare the crime to that of Tiffany Nelson, a nine-year-old who went missing in Augusta, Georgia in June of 1994. She was also riding her bike when she went missing. She was very close to her home. Tiffany um, was in a shallow grave roughly 20 miles away from where she had gone missing. Police and investigators have never found any more of Kia Logan's remains, but they remain hopeful that they will someday. They will finally be able to pursue a suspect or a person of interest. And that's all there was in this story. If you have any information, you can contact the Greenwood County Sheriff's Department at 864-942-8600. Thanks for watching.